our next presentation, I'd like to introduce Dr. Richard Sandberg, Chair of the Computational Mechanics in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Melbourne. Dr. Sandberg's main interest is in high fidelity simulation of turbulent flows and the associated noise generation in order to gain physical understanding of flow and noise mechanisms. He also uses the data to help assess and improve low order models that can be employed in an industrial context, in particular by pursuing novel machine learning approaches. Dr. Sandberg received his PhD in 2004 in aerospace engineering at the University of Arizona, and prior to joining the University of Melbourne, he was the professor of fluid dynamics and aeroacoustics in the aerodynamics and flight mechanics research group at the University of Southampton and headed the UK Turbulence Consortium. He was awarded a Vesky Innovation Fellowship in July 2015 and has been granted an Australian Research Council Future Fellowship for 2020 to 2023. Today, Dr. Sandberg's presentation will show how physical insight relevant to designers can be extracted from high fidelity simulations enabled by the latest HPC systems. The presentation will also discuss how the HPC generated data can be used to develop better predictive models using a machine learning approach that is based on gene expression programming. It will be shown that the ma machine learned models outperform traditional models both for the cases they were trained on and for cases not seen before. Dr. Sandberg, thank you very much for joining us today. Yes, thank you for the introduction and thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, to speak. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, yes, I'm going to talk about combining high fidelity CFP and machine learning um, to better predict flow and jet engines. Um, and uh, I'll start straight away by asking the question, why do we care uh, about the flow inside of a jet engine? Well, I would argue if we better understand or predict the flow inside of an engine, we can make better engines. Uh, and, and why is that important? Um, th that we can see from the sheer scale of, um, of the use of such engines. So if we think of just Australia, um, in 2018, uh, we consumed about 9.4 billion liters of aviation fuel. Um, and of course, even though we are a pretty travel happy nation, um, th this is not the biggest market. There are other markets um, like the US and Asia and Europe that are even even larger. Uh, and the passenger numbers are forecast to continue growing. Um, despite that little blip that we have right now, um, the projections still show that we will see uh, further increases in, in, um, in travel numbers. Uh, and that's gonna mean even more aviation fuel uh, that we're gonna have to use. Um, so we wanna reduce that fuel consumption. And for each percent um, that we can reduce the fuel consumption or, or, or the increase the efficiency of a jet engine, uh, we, we can reduce fuel costs by quite sizable amounts, um, and we also can reduce CO2 emissions. So, so the problem uh, definitely is worth tackling. Um, now, where does computing come in? Um, if we want to further increase the efficiency of these engines, they are already incredibly efficient and good, um, and correlation-based approaches, as has been used in the past, are unable to further improve efficiencies. Uh, we need to go to more radical concepts, um, and those can't easily be tackled with um, with correlations that we have from previous systems. Uh, and also experiments and, and the testing um, is very expensive. Uh, so this is where computational fluid dynamics comes in. Uh, computational fluid dynamics or CFD um, predictions have, have become an integral part of the design of modern gas turbines. Um, and the idea really is that we want to design as much as we can using the computer and then really only test um, the most promising um, designs that we've come up with. Okay, so why, why do we need HPC? Um, and the answer is simple. Um, simulating flows through uh, engines of, of a jet en or a jet engine um, is very expensive. Um, so if we run high fidelity simulations, uh, as we have a, an example here, um, where we can see a lot of tiny little um, turbulent structures going through a passage of a turbine, um, we, we get the high accuracy that we need in order to improve these systems, um, but the cost is extremely high. Um, so if we want to resolve all these uh, dynamically important structures that we have um, in the flow, um, we can have problems that have a size of roughly 10 to the 16 degrees of freedom. So, so we really need um, very large systems in order to tackle those kind of high fidelity um, simulations. Um, why do we need machine learning? Well. In a design context, we can't really afford running hundreds of thousands of design iterations using these high fidelity simulations. So we need modeling. Um, we need to make these simulations cheaper. Um, so industrial design mainly relies on modeling and um, 
models of today are just not good enough in order to get the um, increase in efficiency that we that we can't try to get from from new generation engines. So uh, I'm just showing an example here of um, predictions coming from current models. Uh, they, they tend to be inaccurate for certain problems. They're good for others. Um, but if we think of uh, the flow behind a turbine blade, so here's an example of where we've looked at uh, high fidelity data. Uh, we, we just look at this region here behind the blade. Uh, we want to see what is the wake like because that determines how much loss we're actually generating. And we compare it to a prediction by a current uh, model. Um, this is what we get. So this is the difference here that we see between the high fidelity, which is the black curve, um, and a baseline or a current generation model. Um, so, so there's a pretty large error here. Um, and this is just not good enough if we want to design an engine that has one, if one percentage point better efficiency or even less than that. Uh, we need better accuracy. So this lack of accuracy of current models does limit the impact computational fluid dynamics can have on developing new technologies. And therefore, what we want to do here is we, we want to use machine learning um, and apply it to high fidelity data to improve our model predictions or improve the models that we can then use for um, predicting the flow. So let me start by talking a little bit about the HPC part and um, what, what can we do with the data that we generate on, on these very large systems. Um, in order to fully exploit modern HPC architectures, you, you need a, a code um, that is actually capable of running efficiently. We, we've developed a code over the last uh, 10, 15 years um, that we've kind of kept optimizing and, um, and adapting and porting to, to the latest architectures. Um, it's been thoroughly validated for a number of different problems um, and we, we looked at a number of different problems, internal flows, external flows, uh, the noise produced by blades. Um, and we have different types of uh, technologies to, to deal with blade-to-blade um, -blade interactions where we have moving parts, et cetera. Um, et cetera. Uh, we also have um, immersed boundary techniques um, that allow us to look at flexible structures or moving, um, moving structures uh, and even put roughness onto, onto blades like this turbine blade. Uh, so it's a fairly capable code, and, and one of the key um, metrics is, of course, that it's pretty fast, um, and it's been well optimized to run on very large systems. So, so this is just an example of a weak scaling um, that we've uh, well lo looked at on, on Summit at, at Oak Ridge. Uh, so this is a system that has six, six NVIDIA uh, V100s per node, um, and, and we've pushed it up to pretty high um, numbers of uh, degrees of freedom or, or grid points for, for the mesh that we've looked at. So, so this is an example here, the red line, uh, where we've looked at uh, 33 million grid points per GPU. Um, so if we scale it up to roughly 2,000 GPUs, um, we are getting um, to, to numbers of the order of 50 billion grid points of our mesh, and that's just a spatial resolution. So fairly large problems, but the code scales um, and then handles these problems pretty well. Okay, so what do we do with this code? Um, and I want to just um, look at two examples here of, of how we think HPC-based fidelity simulations can directly affect design of, of these engines, other than just provide data that we then later can use for modeling as well, and I'll, I'll get to that later. Uh, so I want to start with this first example here, uh, which is a low-pressure turbine. Um, and the, the, the problem I want to look at here is if you have two blades, um, we, we have a, a moving blade here and we have a stationary blade, what should the distance be between these two blades in order for us to get the, the most efficiency out of this, out of this engine? Um, so we, we, we've run a number of different calculations where we varied this spacing here between the, the two blades. Um, intuitively, you would think if you put them very close together, um, that's good because you make your machine shorter and therefore you can make it lighter uh, and light is always good in aerospace. Um, and a larger gap would obviously mean a longer engine, probably a heavier engine, and, and that might have some penalty. Um, but let's have a look at what, what we got here. So we, we had 21.5 and 43% of, of the cord size of a blade here as the two different gaps. And these simulations uh, roughly have 10 to the 14 degrees of freedom to, to run. Um, so he, here are just some snapshots. And of course, if we do CFD, we have to show some colorful pictures um, of uh, the, the wakes that come into the passage between two blades. So the, these green kind of lines here, it's a bit hard to see, but uh, those are really the, the blades and, and the black region here is the gap. So what, what, what I want you to focus on is when, when we have a wake um, here coming in, 
how they're going to migrate to this package. And I'm just going to flick through a couple of pictures here. So as we can see, these wakes that are going through the passage are being highly stretched and distorted. Um, and, and what this actually does um, is it does produce um, more turbulence. Um, so, so we get production of turbulence or turbulence kinetic energy in particular by having these wakes um, being you know, swallowed into the, the gap here and then being stretched, distorted, and, and twisted and turned. Uh, now, the, the key thing to see between the two cases, so this is a small gap case where, where these blades are very close together, and this is a larger gap case where, where they're fairly far apart. So the key to see here is that these wakes, when we have a short gap, they don't really have time to decay very much. And when they enter this passage, they actually produce a lot of new turbulence kinetic energy. While in, in the larger gap, before the wakes actually enter this passage, um, they, they have decayed a lot more, so, so the turbulence um, production is a lot smaller. Um, and turbulence production ultimately results in that turbulence decaying and being dissipated, so converted into heat, and that's ultimately a loss. Um, so, so this loss is important, and this needs to be quantified. Um, and if we just take a vertical line downstream of the blade here again and look at uh, what is the profile of this wake, uh, this is the key wake component. It's pretty, pretty similar between the large gap and small gap cases. But we can see there's an extra bump here uh, that comes from the small gap case. And, and this is this extra turbulence production or uh, this loss generated through that. Uh, so in, in short, if we um, reduce the gap, what we see, and uh, this is a, a busy plot here, but I, I wanted to just focus on these two bars. And the larger the bar, the more loss we have in a nutshell. And, and we can see that the small gap case has a larger loss than the, um, than the large gap case. Um, so, so in summary, if we put these two blades closer together, um, we actually increase the overall losses by 0.25%. Um, that might not seem like a lot, but as I said in the introduction, we're burning billions of liters of fuel um, in, in aviation gas turbines and even more, obviously, in stationary gas turbines. So every little increment that we can extract um, or all the knowledge we can get from these simulations that helps us reduce some of these losses is going to be very valuable. Okay, so I want to switch to an even more challenging part uh, of the engine, and that's the high-pressure turbine. Um, so, so this is where we are sitting right downstream of the combustor. So this is where all the very hot gas comes from the combustion process. Um, and we're, we're blowing this very high-pressure and high-temperature gas onto turbine blades. Um, that temperature that we get there tends to be way higher than the melting point of, of, the, uh, of, of the metal um, that um, is being used to, to construct these blades. Uh, and you really wouldn't want to fly on a plane that has blades that are starting to melt. So, so we need to do something about it, um, and, and ultimately these blades are cooled. Um, now, in, our, in order to understand how much we need um, for, for this part to survive, um, we have to accurately um, predict the heat transfer, because if we get the prediction wrong, if we get the temperatures wrong, um, we're not going to be very confident in our design, and we might have to over-design it, or we might see um, more frequent design uh, main maintenance intervals. Um, so, of course, the heat transfer is affected by a large number of pretty complex flow features, um, and uh, I'll just show a few of those. So, so this is from a simulation that shows uh, a pretty complex flow field. There's lots of things going on. I didn't want to go through all of these individual components, um, but, but the key thing to see here is that all, all of these different flow features that we have going on in, in this particular flow regime affect the temperature distribution on the blade. So, so this is looking at the temperature field, and we can see red is, is hotter. So we get from large structures wrapping around the, uh, the edge here um, that give us very high temperature regions, but also in the back of the blade here, uh, we see we have very high temperature. So once we understand those um, flow features, uh, we can then start thinking about how, how are you going to mitigate the effect of that um, high heat transfer and how we protect the blade from actually melting. Um, so we did a parametric study of uh, one of these blades, and parametric in a sense that we actually fired different types of combustor um, exit conditions onto the blade, um, and we had different ways of doing that. You can you can actually put some bars upstream that generate wakes, um, and, and you get some kind of turbulence impinging onto the blade. Uh, we looked at different intensities of that turbulence coming in and different uh, length scales, which means what is the size of the eddy um, that actually um, hits the blade. 
Um, and what, what we found was that the mechanisms that, that um, lead to that heat transfer is very sensitive to these inflow conditions. And that's, of course, um, important to know for any designer. Uh, so, for example, I'm just looking at the top of a blade here again. If we have low intensity of that turbulence coming, um, we, we see a pretty um, regular flow pattern and, and there's not much activity. If we actually increase the intensity of, uh, of the structures coming that way, hitting the blade, we can see we start seeing transition to a more disorderly flow, uh, a turbulent flow much earlier. And, and the effect of that is that if I look at the, the, the heat transfer, so this is just the heat flux, um, and uh, let's just focus on this part here, which is the, uh, the, the upper side of the blade. So essentially it's this surface here that I'm looking at. Um, we, we can see that this black line here, which is this case, uh, shows a much higher and earlier um, increase to, uh, to, to high uh, heat flux values, which means uh, that, that we need to be more careful in this situation and, and, and how we actually protect the blade uh, from the hot gas. And just as a side note, uh, the black dots here are from um, laboratory experiments at, um, at a similar condition. So we can see that the high fidelity simulation really does a pretty good job in uh, picking up the, the complex flow physics that we have in these um, in these flows. Okay, so so this is what I wanted to just give as examples on the um, on the HPC side. You know, what what can we do there? How, how do we influence um, designer um, or industrial design decisions by having access to, to that high fidelity data. Now I want to switch to uh, the machine learning part. What, what do we do with the data? Um, if, and, and can we use machine learning to actually um, get some, some modeling out of, out of these high fidelity data? So the first question we have to ask, of course, is um, what goes wrong in the, in the current turbulence models? And uh, one of the key assumptions in turbulence modeling is that we, we have a linear coupling between the turbulent stress or the Reynolds stress, the so-called Reynolds stress, and, and the strain rates. <clears throat> so, so in principle, uh, this is the, the turbulent stress or the Reynolds stress, and we couple it linearly to the strain rate by having some kind of so-called eddy viscosity or turbulence viscosity uh, that is a scalar. So, so we have that linear coupling, um, and we know that um, this linear coupling um, is not very good at, at representing uh, the anisotropy that we have in turbulent flows in particular in more general turbulent flows. So, so this linear coupling ha has been a good assumption for, for flexible flows, but it, it doesn't work in more challenging conditions. Uh, and on top of that, the Reynolds stress does show up in a lot of different areas of turbulence modeling. So it, it, it's obviously a closure for the Reynolds stress that we use that linear model, um, but it also shows up in the transport equations for turbulence. So it, it shows up everywhere, and, and therefore it seems like a, a, a very obvious target um, of, of a particular um, part of the modeling that, that should be uh, improved. So how can we improve this uh, Reynolds stress model? Well, we can simply start by saying, let's make it nonlinear. Um, so let's go away from this linear assumption and add um, some kind of additional terms. Um, and I'll try to explain what these terms are. So, so we, we essentially have the, the original model here in black, and then we add these additional terms. Uh, where these tensors T are uh, basis functions that depend on the velocity gradient tensor. So it's, it's, a, it's a variable that we, that we can calculate from, from, the, um, from the mean flow. Um, and, and these are our independent tensor variables. And then we have these coefficients um, that, that pre-multiply these basis functions. And these are unknown coefficients um, that in turn, again, are functions of these independent variables, the I, one to five, and these are the tensor invariants of the velocity gradient tensor. So we kind of know these eyes from the velocity field. Uh, we, we know the basis functions. We, we just don't know how do we build a suitable linear combination of these different basis functions using coefficients that depend on these invariants that actually improves the model. And this is really where the machine learning comes in. We want to find these uh, theta terms, um, and, and we want to find them by using the high fidelity data that we have available. Okay, so, so th this is our task. We want to find these theta, and, and it, in principle, can take any functional form. So, so that's completely unknown, and this is why we want to use an approach that is um, quite flexible. 
So how do we find these theta terms that give us the best model? Um, and and to, to make it even more challenging or to put another constraint on this, we actually want these theta terms to, to be known symbolically. Why do we want them symbolically? Well, it makes it in interpretable. Um, so, so this is maybe in, in relation to what uh, Catherine talked about earlier, is, is that we want to have models that um, don't only accurately predict a solution, but we want to be able to interpret these models too. Uh, so, so we want to do the same here, um, but also it, it has a big benefit that they become plug and play. So once you have a model that you can write down as an equation, you can just slot it into your favorite code and, and you can run it. Um, so so the, the approach we're taking in order to develop those kind of models is to um, use an evolutionary algorithm. Um, so we want to evolve suitable functions for these thetas. And, and we borrow concepts from biology. Um, so, so we base everything on survival of the fittest, um, where we kind of go from generation to generation, and we see incremental improvements in the performance of these models via some kind of genetic operation, such as cloning, mutation, or, or crossover. And I'll, I'll show a diagram in a second how we actually do that. Now, evolutionary algorithms um, have some caveats, and what we really need to ensure is that we get models that are sy syntactically correct. Um, so how, how do we do that? And the way to, to do that is to actually use a specific form of an evolutionary algorithm uh, called gene expression programming. Um, so, so this GP approach um, actually transforms symbols to equations. Um, and we do that by having um, essentially breaking down a so-called chromosome, which is here an individual of a, of a population into, into a head um, that contains uh, the function set. So we have operators such as the square root, a plus, um, times, and some symbols. And then we also have a tail that contains a terminal set. Um, and, and by keeping this list of symbols that does exist linearly in a code, um, we can convert it to an expression tree uh, that we can then read, uh, and basically that gives us the predictive model, uh, which always is a valid expression, uh, so syntactically correct, um, and this expression or model can be nonlinear. Okay, so, so how, how do I evolve this over time? How do I make it better over time? Uh, we start just by having some kind of random population, and that's really the key. Um, we, we, we don't impose any specific um, functional form initially, we just pick a random population of, of different individuals. Um, we then evaluate the fitness of each of these models, and I'll just talk about the cost functions or the fitness functions in, in, in a moment. Um, and then we pick the best ones through some kind of natural selection, and these best individuals are, are then uh, combined or, um, you know, we, we apply genetic modifications to these uh, individuals. We, we get an updated set of individuals. We update this whole population and we, we keep going in this loop. Um, and, and hopefully um, the fitness of these models then improves over generations. Uh, and the, the last generation or the fittest model of that last generation then is the training outcome or, or the best model that we're going to use. Okay, and one of the key things we had to do um, to this GP method is to extend it to also work for tensors and vectors um, because that's ultimately what we need for turbulence modeling. Okay, so cost functions. Uh, that, that's one of the key criteria or one of the most important parts of, of, the, of the training here. Um, how do we assess whether the model is good or not? Um, and, and there are really two different ways. Um, so the, 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 well, the so-called frozen approach is an approach that I think most uh, groups are currently working on. And that's using an, an a priori cost function that's essentially based on a, on a given data set. Um, so just in, as, a, as an example, um, the, the frozen approach essentially takes any model that is um, suggested or proposed by the GP algorithm. It, it evaluates that model and compares that model to the data. So, so we just look at the difference between the prediction and the data. And, and we do that for, the, say, the Reynolds stress, for example. Um, th this has maybe multiple disadvantages. W one is you need access to the full Reynolds stress um, for the whole field um, from some kind of high fidelity or something else. So it, it's, it's restricted to the availability of, of that data, of these complete data sets. And also we are restricted to looking at just that quantity. Uh, and, and the Reynolds stress is an important part of our turbulence model, but it's not the ultimate outcome that we're interested in. We want to know 
for example, what is the pressure or what is the velocity downstream of the blade. <clears throat> so another cost function is something we call in the loop. Uh, so, so this is a quite new approach uh, that we've suggested just uh, about a year ago. Um, and it, it's an a posteriori cost function, meaning that every model um, that is proposed by our GEP algorithm is evaluated externally um, using some kind of external software. So we, we run a full prediction, uh, a predictive case with that model or each of the models that have been proposed. We, we get the outputs from that model and we take those and um, evaluate those against the reference data. So, so here, as an example, we, we can just take this, this line again that I've been showing over and over. We, we know what the wake profile is from our high fidelity data and we compare the model prediction that, that has been coming from that external software to that um, original or reference data. We see what the error is and we keep going back. So, so there's a fundamental difference between these two and the benefits of this in the loop training are that it's a lot more flexible. Um, so now we're not restricted to just um, evaluating the anisotropy tensor or the renal stress tensor. The cost function can be anything. Uh, it could be what is the um, what, what is the drag of the body? Um, what, what is the um, lift that the blade is generating? A anything the designer might be interested in, or the heat flux, or heat transfer. Uh, it's also very robust because we don't need a full set of high fidelity data anymore. We just need these profiles um, or individual points that are of interest. Um, and it's also, in a way, more ready to apply because the models, as they've been run in the external software. Uh, to evaluate them and to evolve them um, have been proven to work. So we don't need extra validation anymore. We know that these models actually do work. And, and this is just showing this schematically. Uh, so this is our evolutionary algorithm that keeps, keeps updating these models by doing all these uh, mutations and, and the genetic operations. Each of these candidate models then get sent to an external software and each of these models from one population can be run in parallel. So, so we can actually speed up that process quite a bit. And then we get the results from these predictions. We, we can evaluate those and we, we check whether we need to continue to update um, our models. Okay, so that's all theory, um, but does it actually work? Do we, do we actually get that to work? Um, and I'll show a few examples here. So it, here I'm gonna show a model that we've trained on um, one of the cases I showed earlier. So, so this comes from the HPC part. Um, we, we took the high pressure turbine at a particular Reynolds number, that's essentially an operating condition. It's, it's more or less how, how quickly the flow is going to pass through um, this passage here. Uh, and it's a measure of how turbulent it is. Um, so, so we've trained the model on this data set. This is the standard model that I showed earlier. So this is one of those linear models. And after running our training over this data set, we essentially get this extension here. Um, so so th these are the coefficients of the zetas here. These are the basis functions. Um, so, so you can see we, we have a symbolic uh, equation here. We can interpret it. So one thing I can look at is I can see this coefficient here, for example, is pre-multiplying my first basis function. So it gives me a measure of how much extra diffusion is this model actually adding um, to the original model. And that's very useful to know um, if we want to understand why is that model actually working better or not. So let me just see how good is that model if we now test it. And we're not going to test it on the case that we trained it on. We're going to test it on different problems. Um, so this here is an example where we use the same geometry as this one here. Uh, again, it's a high pressure turbine, but it's at a much higher Reynolds number. Um, the blue lines always come from the current generation turbulence models that are currently in industry use, uh, that they, those we call baseline. Um, the black lines are the high fidelity data sets that we've obtained from running these cases on, on the HPC systems. And the red lines are these in the loop, uh, the, the GP trained models where we use a CFD code as an external evaluator. Um, so this is the in the loop training. So you can see for, for the um, high pressure turbine at, at a higher Reynolds number, we're actually doing pretty well. Uh, we're seeing a, a much improved solution over baseline. If we look at two other cases, these are low pressure turbines, so they have a completely different geometry. They have different characteristics of the flow. Um, again, um, the, the CFD-driven or the in-the-loop type GP uh, models, uh, the, the trained models, 
definitely outperform the baseline quite quite a bit. Um, so so they're, they're doing quite good actually, even better than we would have thought because this is such a different um, different flow. Um, so, so the key is that we, we can reduce the error for all of these cases by a factor of more than five using the same model that we trained on a single data set. Um, so, so it definitely generalizes uh, pretty well. And, and this is the key thing. We want to find models that have captured the right physics uh, so that we don't have to train and train and again for each case that we want to run we want to find models that are then applicable to a whole class of problems without having to retrain okay so this is an example i'm just looking at uh, the performance of a turbine blade um, I, I want to look at another example here and, and this is heat flux modeling um, so, so one important problem in, in in jet engines or in turbine blades is, is actually cooling this um, half section of the of the blade so this is where the blade becomes very thin and we really can't afford to to bring too much heat to the metal here. Um, so we have we have a, a cooling jet coming out of the blade here that that protects um, this edge here. Um, so we basically ran a number of um, highly resolved high fidelity simulations uh, of different conditions. So, so you can change your your thickness here. You can change the blowing ratio between the two streams. Uh, so we had a whole matrix of cases that we were looking at um, that we could train models on. And what we're interested in is what is the temperature distribution on, on this wall here. So in, in terms of heat flux modeling, um, the typical thing there is to also say we have a linear coupling between this is the heat flux and the temperature gradient. So, so they're linearly coupled with this parameter alpha. And if we use a, a so-called eddy diffusivity model, it's a linear model. Um, we just have the eddy viscosity or the turbulence viscosity over a constant um, that is relating those two. If we do our training, um, we, we essentially get um, a more complex model. Um, so, so this is we're re replacing this standard model with this machine learned model here. Um, and what this does is if we look at the temperature distribution, so again, this is along this wall. Um, the, the red line here is our high fidelity simulation. Uh, the green lines are what, what we get from current generation models, and, and the blue line is a trained heat flux model that we get from our GP tool. Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely doing a lot better. Now, this is testing the model on the case we trained it on, so you could say that's easy. Um, but we've then applied the same model, um, so this is always this model here, uh, on a number of other um, cases where we have different blowing ratios or uh, different um, thicknesses of the uh, of, of these edges here uh, and again we can see that the trained models which are the blue lines uh, nearly coincide with the red lines which are the high fidelity solution so we're, we're actually doing pretty well um, here in, in predictive accuracy of these models okay so the ultimate goal of all of this is that we, we really want to help um, design better engines that are more efficient so that we can save both more emissions um, and so we start by looking at a, sim a system like this. Obviously, this is still way beyond capabilities of HPC. We can't simulate the whole engine uh, in, in a high fidelity sense. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take the engine. We're going to break it down into a number of simplified um, problems, but that are relevant and contain most of the um, important physics. Um, so, so then we run uh, these different configurations and problems on an HPC system um, using high fidelity simulation approaches. Uh, we, we can learn from the, these simulations. We get some physical insight uh, that, that hopefully has direct benefit to designers, um, such as you know, what is the optimal gap size or something else. Um, then we use the same data uh, to, to machine learn new models that hopefully are more accurate. And with those new, more accurate models, we can then predict um, the whole system because the, the cost of these modeled um, uh, simulations are, of course, a lot cheaper. So um, th that's the whole point of doing all of this, uh, and we hope to contribute to seeing cleaner engines in the future. Okay, so that's pretty much what I wanted to say. I, I'd like to thank all my uh, contributors to, to this talk. Uh, you know, they, they've really done most of the hard work, as usual and also the computing centers that have provided all the computing time uh, that we've used for um, these simulations. Okay, so thanks for your attention and um, I'll be happy to take any questions.